think about what de novo assembly means. In our context, de novo assembly is going to basically mean, you know, what this picture is showing, in that we're going to have short reads, and we are going to assemble them just into contigs. Our goal is not going to be to go all the way um, into the scaffold level, although our, our program will give us that. And we're definitely not going to finish these genomes. We're not going to take them all the way back to the original chromosomes or plasmids from which the sequence data is derived. We're interested in going from reads to contigs because we should be able to mine enough comparative information looking at the contigs from these isolates to compare them to what is known, um, to publish them, and to ask a lot of really good meaningful questions um, to interrogate those genomes meaningfully. So let's think a little bit more about this. So how do you generate contigs from reads? That's our basic question, okay? And so in order to understand that, we need to learn just a little bit about a kind of mathematics called graph theory. So that's the math that underlies taking reads, right? Looking for areas of overlap, right? Connecting them together, and here it says reads connected by overlap, um, but there's going to be a little bit more to it than that. And then, and then figuring out what the order should be in which these fragments should be placed in order to derive contigs or larger structures that are representative of the original sequence. Here the figure is saying finding a Hamiltonian path. We'll talk about Hamiltonian path identification but we'll also talk about Eulerian paths. <clears throat> so genome theory or genome assembly relies on an area of math called graph theory. Again, it's easy to think, um, and in fact, you've probably heard me say this to you in an oversimplification when first introducing the idea of genome assembly. You've probably heard me say, okay, we'll take these short raw reads shown here in the middle, and if we want to get back to something that looks like the target genome, looks like where the data came from, what we're going to do is we're just going to stack these things up, and we're going to look for areas of overlap. Overlap would be identified by alignment, by the way, right? And wherever there's overlap that is meaningful, we'll put those pieces together, and then we'll have longer structures called contigs. And in fact, this is the original approach to genome assembly. It's something called overlap consensus assembly. But um, that's not going to be how we do our assembly. And I'll tell you why over the next little, little while. So the reason is, is that overlap-based assembly, overlap consensus assembly, works really well if you have um, just a very few reads. Like here, we've got these few reads here. They're derived from this original sequence. And we can take just a few reads and, you know, intellectually or just working with a, our brains, a piece of paper and a pencil or pen, we can stack them up and we can see pretty easily how we can orient them so that we can get back to this original sequence. And that's fine. That's an example of overlap based assembly working pretty well. This also works really well if you have really long and very correct reads. And you should know by now that the technology that gives you really long and really correct reads, one of the best ones is the original Sanger sequencing. Okay, And hopefully, at some point, um, things like the nanopore tech will be long and correct. Right now, they're just really long. Now, as we dial up the complexity, however, right? That overlap consensus approach, it re worked really well in the example I just showed you, but what if I gave you this data here? So here we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16, you know, short pretend reads that are only three bases long. So that's a pretty tiny data set, but I dare you to try to stack that up and find a consensus overlap sequence. You're going to have to spend a lot of time doing that. You can do it, it's in there, but you'll have to spend a lot of time doing it, and it will really use up a lot of so-called bandwidth, right, in your brain.
So now imagine that you've got millions of those things and they're 250 base pairs long. You can see pretty quickly that computationally, this overlap consensus-based approach is gonna get really challenging and really time consuming. Furthermore, what you will see when you try to assemble these just looking for overlap consensus is that because we've got some repeats in here, ATG, ATG, and ATG, that means we've got more than one possible way to put those things together to get one longer sequence. So we can't get to one final answer easily using this approach. In other words, repeats really complicate genome assembly when you are trying to do it by overlap consensus. Now remember what you know about especially eukaryotic genomes. Let's use the human genome as an example. 50% of the human genome, or close to it, is comprised of repetitive sequences, things like telomeres and centromeres, and things like the ALU sequence, which is about 300 base pairs long. That's a pretty long fragment of DNA that is found literally just all over the human genome. So you're gonna have an awful lot of repeats that are, that are more complex than just these ATGs are. When you start to take that data and try to put it back together using overlap consensus, you can do it, but it's gonna take you a long time. So while in theory and in practice, overlap consensus as an approach to genome assembly will work. It certainly is possible, and it is how we generated the first human genome and most of the large genomes that were sequenced um, you know, early in the genomics era. It's a very slow process, so you'll look like this by the time you get your project done, uh, or something like that, and it's also very computationally demanding. And uh, computational demand is, um, is a big challenge these days. We have a lot of you know, we have an explosion of big data. We talked about that earlier in the semester, and we just, we need to have approaches for looking at this genomic data that don't, don't demand quite as much um, computational resource. So, so what? So what's the approach, right? So we're generating more and more short read data from more and more organisms. Many of those organisms are eukaryotic and they're very complex. Um, others are simpler, but nonetheless, the, the data accumulation is significant, the computational demand and the expectations are increasing. So how do we approach these genomes? How do we approach assembling these genomes more efficiently? And so while that is a very 21st century uh, question or problem, I'm gonna take you back next to the 1700s to someone whose name was Leonard Euler he lived in a Prussian city that was then called Konigsberg. And um, Euler was one of the great fathers of modern day mathematics. He invented graph theory. He invented something called Eulerian paths or also related to Eulerian cycles. He did this back in 1736. He also invented, any of you who've gotten through basic algebra know uh, equations that start where you've got f at x. Well, that was Euler that invented that. And a lot of other common math that you and I use uh, was invented by this guy. So Euler, back in the 1700s, this is almost 300 years ago, right? He was really intrigued by a question that the citizens of Konigsberg have. That was uh, in then-day Prussia, now in Russia. It's uh, called Kaliningrad, Kaliningrad now. And anyway, this geographical area, it has a, a river running through it, right, shown here in blue. And it has these, these land masses here, here, uh, here, and here. And then each of these, like, green areas are bridges. So there are seven bridges. And um, the citizens wanted to know if they could go for a walk in their city and cross each bridge only once, therefore hitting every landmass connected by bridges. And Euler wanted to see if he could solve that problem. That's what we're going to talk about briefly next.